Good morning. How's everyone doing this morning? Man, you made it out of bed of that chilly. Whoo, man, it was like minus eight when I got to the church this morning. And for all of you joining online, you're snuggled up on a couch or a bed. We're a little bit jealous of you, but we're glad that you could join us online. Well, last weekend, we started a brand new series called Now What? Now What? And I believe that 20 years from now that we're going to look back on this period of time and realize some of the things that we're living through. That I believe that we're going to look at it and see it as some of those defining moments in our history, personally for you. And, and look, we'll look back and see how did really cancel culture impact the church moving forward. How will Christians have responded to adversity and, and, and criticism from our world? So today, we're going to be taking a look at uh, something I believe is very um, imperative that, that we really take a self evaluation of our lives. I talked about cancel culture here, and last weekend I did a whole message on, you know, what I believe, how the enemy wants to cancel Christianity. If you missed that message, I would encourage you to go back and watch it on, on YouTube. But today we're going to be tackling the topic of famine, spiritual famine, famine and hunger. Now, anybody here hungry? Did you eat breakfast this morning? You know, <clears throat> It's funny, and, and we're just coming off the holidays, and, and Susan and I have been talking, and, and not a lot, but usually around those big meals, she'll, you know, after the meal, she'll be like, man, like, some people prep days in advance for Thanksgiving. Anybody, like, prep days in advance for, like, Thanksgiving? You can get some, you know, like, hey, as much as I can get done on Wednesday, then that would be better. I don't have to do on Thursday. And, and the same maybe for Christmas for you. And you prep, and you prep, you spend hours, some people days, and then you sit down in this meal, and 15 minutes later, it's done. And you're like, I just spent hours, and we're done in 15 minutes. And, and something that I've noticed, that when I'm hungry, I eat food. I know, this is life-changing. <laughs> I know, it's really shocking. But I eat food when I'm hungry. But here's the thing is our physical bodies, that when we're hungry, we eat. Who here ate breakfast? Anybody? I didn't eat breakfast. I didn't, and I don't typically eat breakfast because I don't like preaching on a full stomach. And so I'll, you know, we go eat after. But I'm usually, right now, I'm kind of a little bit of hungry, though. I'm not going to lie. And one of my favorites lately has been the uh, wake-up wrap from Dunkin'. Anybody get a wake-up wrap? Have anybody had those? They're really good. I don't know if they're trying to make, like, the egg sandwich healthy or something. But, I mean, I put egg and cheese and sausage on it. But, mm. oh, so I bet you now you're like, okay, I wasn't hungry before, Pastor, but now I'm getting a little hungry. And... <laughs> and so I eat, and now that wasn't enough to satisfy me, just more of a tease. But when you eat, then you're satisfied, right? You're hungry, your physical body, you're hungry, you eat, ah, oh, satisfied. But what about our spiritual bodies? When you think about it, when it comes to our spiritual life, actually the opposite is true. That when you are, when you go a long time without eating spiritual food, without having spiritual food in your life, what happens is you actually don't begin to crave spiritual food. You begin to crave less and less the longer you go without it. It's the opposite. The opposite happens. The longer I go without physical food, man, the more I crave it. The longer I go without spiritual food, the less I crave it. And then the opposite is true when I feed myself spiritually. When I feed myself spiritually, man, I'm in my word, I'm praying, I'm attending church, I'm serving, I'm doing all the things God has called me to do. Guess what? I crave it more. It's the opposite. When I feed myself spiritually, I actually crave it more. Spiritual famine has been a problem in our country for probably the last 30 plus years. But it's now becoming a problem in the church. Maybe you've heard the last leading up, you know, you've, you've heard about the last days. You've heard about, you know, the end times. Back in October, I did a, a series on end times and what we can expect leading up to the tribulation and from then on. But 
and maybe you've heard that there's going to be this great spiritual awakening right leading up to the rapture and, and that many people are going to be saved. Although I do believe that that is true, it doesn't tell the whole story. Because the last days, just before the rapture, just before the tribulation, leading up to it, there's actually going to be a spiritual famine. And the Bible tells us about this, and Paul speaks to it. In 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 1 to 5, this is what Paul is describing here, what it's going to look like in the last days leading up to the rapture. He says, but mark this. There will be terrible times in the last days. People will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, boastful, proud, abusive, disobedient to their parents, ungrateful, unholy, without love, unforgiving, slanderous, without self-control, brutal, not lovers of of good, treacherous, rash, conceited, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, having a form of godliness but denying its power have nothing to do with such people. This is Paul describing what it's going to look like. And as I walk, look through that list, I'm like, hmm, it's pretty close describes the culture and world in which we live. I think we need to pay attention to what God's word has to say. There's a research group called Barna Research, and he does large-scale studies on Christians in the church, really the leading research group in the church world across the country. And he did a, a, a report on the state of the church through 2020. And this is what he said. He said, the most startling realization is how many people from evangelical churches are adopting unbiblical beliefs. Evangelical church, that's us, we're a spirit-filled evangelical church. And Barna's saying across the country that it's startling to him the amount of churches that are adopting unbiblical beliefs because it doesn't line up with culture, says. It might make some people uncomfortable, therefore they're caving in to the world and teaching unbiblical things. So he goes on to the report and says that you know evangelicals used to be see the Bible as the infallible, inerrant word of God. He said, used to. Now, 52% of evangelical Christians do not believe in objective moral truth. That's you and me. Evangelical Christians. 52% do not believe in objective moral truth that comes from God's word. It's a big problem. And I believe one of the reasons why uh, that we need to look at is how many people... Read their Bible. This is the next study they did. How many Christians are reading their Bible? And he said, not, how many Christians do not read their Bible? We have, what, one? Okay, one, that would be all right. One out of ten don't read their Bible. Is it? No, two, two out of ten, so, or 20%. What is it? Three, three out of ten don't, and four. Forty percent. Four out of ten Christians are not reading their Bible. This is a problem that God's word is truth and and it's our guide and and it's how we know how to live our life. And we have four out of ten Christians not reading their Bible. Our appetite for truth and conviction and correction is eroding at a dangerous pace. So now what? Now what? what, what, Now where do we go? And and where I want to take you is to John chapter 15 because Jesus tells us a a parable, an illustration that I believe is applicable for us today. And Jesus titled this this parable or this illustration as the true vine. The true vine. So we start reading in John chapter 15 verse 1. It says, I am the true vine and my father is the gardener. My father is the gardener. Do we have any gardeners out here that you enjoy gardening? And I, no. <laughs> no. I don't enjoy it at all. I, I, you know, do the bare minimum. I'll like, you know, get the bags, go to Lowe's, pick up all the mulch, mulch, and then 
but I'm not a gardener, so I had to do a little research and, and found that a gardener does a lot of work, and, and it's really important for the health of whatever it is that you're planting. And in Jesus' case, he's talking about vines and grapes, and we're going to kind of walk through this a little bit, but how important the gardener is. And Jesus is saying, I'm the vine, and, but my father is the gardener. And to achieve the best productivity, right, to get the best-looking grapes, the attention of the gardener is needed for this vine. You see, if the vine just grows and and it it just is allowed to grow wild, which, you know, you'd think, hey, if I just want it to grow, that it will be okay. But actually, it makes the fruit less productive and left untouched, the vine is less productive. The same is true with our life. If we just leave our lives untouched, we don't allow the Holy Spirit, we don't allow God to work in and through our lives, then we're going to be less productive as Christians. You see, Paul said this, this is the importance of God's role in our life. He says, I planted the seed, Paul says in 1 Corinthians 3, 6, I planted the seed, Paul says, Apollos watered it, but God made it grow. God is the one who made it grow. So let's move on. Verse 2, Jesus continues. He says, he cuts off every branch in me that bears no fruit, while every branch that does bear fruit he prunes so that it will be even more fruitful. So here, Jesus is speaking to two different kinds of branches. We have fruitful branches, and we have unfruitful branches. And these branches, they represent um, people who claim to be believers. He says, you know what, yep, I'm a believer. Or maybe who used to be a believer and has turned their back on their faith. Now we know that everyone who claims to be a believer is not really one. And is not really going to heaven. Jesus said this, not me. (laughs) Jesus said in Matthew chapter 7 verse 21, he says, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. He says, there's going to be people that claim to be, but their, their hearts and their lives really don't line up with the word of God. And this is where spiritual famine comes in. It comes in and it destroys our lives. Not reading your word, which Barna's research says four to ten evangelical believers are not reading their word. Not praying, not attending church consistently. You cannot convince me that you can go a long period of time without talking to God reading his word, attending church, and still walk in the plans and purposes that God has for your life. You just cannot convince me of it. But that's exactly what matters to God, is that you're doing his will, that you're walking in the plans and purposes of things that he has called you to. That's what matters. Because we read the second half of that verse where Jesus says, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. And he says, but... This is who the ones who does the will of my Father, who is in heaven, will enter. Not the ones who say, Lord, Lord, who who claim, who who on the outside might look like it. But no, no, it's the ones who do the will of my Father, Jesus says. You need to take notice. If you're feeling yourself beginning to lose your appetite for the things of God. Are you losing your appetite for spiritual things? If you find yourself saying, I'll read my Bible tomorrow, or or, or I'll go to church, uh, I'll I'll do all these things when I have time. Can I tell you, you'll never have time. The enemy will make sure you never have time. He'll make sure that you stay busy, that you're too busy to read your Bible, that you're too busy to do your devotions and pray, too busy to attend church, too busy to serve. He will make sure you are busy. So you can slide into spiritual famine. We will become like one of those branches that Jesus described that will bear no fruit. Because Jesus said there's going to be those that will bear fruit and those that will not. Jesus talked about this pruning process. Talked about this pruning process, and this is, you know, where the gardener comes in and, and, and begins to prune. And successful gardeners, and if you're a gardener, you know that this pruning is really um, so needed in the life and health of whatever it is that you are trying to make grow. Cutting back 
the branches actually increase the fruit. I mean, now logically this process, it doesn't make a whole lot of sense, right? You would think, well, if I, if I want this vine to grow to be 20 feet long, then I'll just leave it and let it grow. Not when it gets to 10 feet, cut it back a foot. That doesn't make sense. You think you just want to let it grow. But actually, when you cut it back, it becomes more healthy. The same is true with our physical bodies, right? You think about our physical bodies, that if, you, if I want my muscle to get, a, get bigger, guess what I have to do? Tear it. I have to rip it. That's what happens when you lift weights. You begin to tear the muscle, and it grows back stronger. Any ladies out there try to grow your hair long? Or guys, maybe. Guys try to grow your hair. And what do you do? And, and we have several hairdressers that attend our church, they'll tell you, hey, if you want your hair to grow long, you have to trim it. You just don't let it go for, you know, 18 months without touching it. You kind of let it grow, trim it a little bit. Let it grow, you trim it. It's, it's this pruning process that really helps hair, muscles, vines be healthy. Spiritually, we're the same way. I know for me, I've always been stronger on the other side of adversity. Every time I walk through something that's been hard, that's been difficult, that's challenged me, that, man, is, I've always come out stronger. I've always have grown in the valleys. When I'm walking through adversity, when I'm walking through some kind of situation that's tough, that's difficult, Whenever I'm out on the other side, I don't always notice it when I'm in the middle, but I'm on the other side, I look back, and I'm like, man, I'm stronger. Man, God really molded me and shaped me, and I'm, I'm stronger now than I was when I started. God prunes us and molds us and shapes us. Good branches still need to be pruned to get the most growth. So as we continue on, in verse 3, Jesus said, you already clean, you are, sorry, you are already clean because of the word I have spoken to you. So Jesus is saying, you know what, you are already clean. So here he, in, this, in this parable, this illustration, Jesus is speaking to the disciples. And he's telling them basically, essentially, that, you know, you're saved. You're clean. You've accepted who I am in your life. And so really for us, this is, you know what, I've accepted salvation, that I am saved. I, you know, I believe that Jesus died on the cross, rose from my sins. Okay, this is, this is speaking to Christians and believers. You are clean because of the words that I've spoken. But then in verse 4, he says, okay, you're saved, you're clean, you believe. Okay, but verse 4 says, remain in me. Remain in me as I remain in you. He gives more instructions for believers that we need to remain in him. This is not a one-time idea. This is not a one-time, you know, prayer, Lord Jesus, forgive me of my sins, and then never pick up the Bible again. Jesus is like, no, no, you need to remain in me. This is an ongoing commitment, moment by moment, decision of, by decision. I need to follow Christ. I need to remain in him. We're not called to be passive believers. We're not just called to be hearers of the word, but doers of the word. And when we are on active mission, when we as believers and Christians, and we are on active mission, rarely do those Christians slide into spiritual famine. And that's what it is. It's a sliding. You just don't wake up one morning and you're like, oh, I'm in a spiritual famine. No, no, it's decision here. A decision over here. I'm going to not read my Bible here. I'm going to take a break here. And, and all of a sudden, it usually takes weeks, if not months. All of a sudden, then maybe one day you wake up and realize, man, the last six months, the last three months, man, I've, I've slid far further than I ever wanted to or ever thought that I would. And that's why Jesus says, you need to remain in me. You, you need to stick close to me, and I will remain in you. Jesus continues on in verse 4. He says, No branch can bear fruit by itself. It must remain in the vine. Neither can you bear fruit unless you remain in me. So Jesus is saying, hey, if you want to produce some fruit, you're going to have to remain in me. But here's the thing. 
Grapevines can actually, if you break it away from the vine, can actually still produce foliage and leaves for a period. If you were to break a piece off, just let it sit there, it would actually continue to bear foliage and and leaves. It's not bearing fruit. But leaves, it can do leaves and foliage. And what do leaves and foliage do? They cover, right? They they cover up. Let's go to Genesis chapter 3, where Adam and Eve have sinned. They're running away from God. God's looking for them in the garden. And they've eaten the fruit. So they look, they see, they're, hey, we're naked. We need to cover up. And what do they use to cover up? It says, the eyes of both of them were opened, and they knew that they were naked, and they sewed fig leaves together to cover themselves. You see, you can be disconnected from the vine, still grow some leaves, and cover it up for a little bit. You can cover up your life for a little bit, and you can kind of, might look like that you're a Christian, look like that you're a believer, look like that everything is okay, but you won't bear any fruit. The leaves will cover it up for a season and for a time, but it won't produce any fruit. See, just as the vine cannot produce fruit unless it's connected, we can't produce anything, Jesus said can't produce anything unless we remain in him, unless we stay connected to him. And if you're connected to Jesus and you're abiding in him and and you have a fruitful prayer life and you're reading your Bible and going to church and serving, you will never slip into spiritual famine if you remain in Jesus. Jesus himself, when he walked the the face of this earth, he had a dependency on his Father. How You read throughout the Gospels, Jesus often, it says, would slip away and pray. I mean, if the Son of God needed to stay connected to the Father, how much do we need to stay connected to Jesus? Amen? So as Jesus continues on in this illustration, he says, I am the vine and you're the branches if you remain in me and I in you. You will bear much fruit, but apart from me, you can do nothing. So what's this fruit? Like, Pastor, you're talking about fruit. Clearly, you don't mean grapes for believers. So what is this fruit? Well, I believe as Christians that we need to produce fruit. So what does that look like? Well, that looks like you sharing your faith with someone and them accepting Jesus as their Lord and Savior. That's fruit. Fruits of the Spirit, right? Finding Galatians, you know, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, self-control. All those things, when you have those things alive in your life. Uh, if you are pouring into a young believer. So maybe you're, you've been a believer for, you know, however long. And, and then you're pouring yourself and you're discipling someone else that is younger than you in the faith. That's fruit. Being obedient. Man, when you are obedient, it's fruit. That's saying, you know what? When the Holy Spirit and God is speaking to you to make a decision in your life, and you're saying, okay, God, I'm going to listen to you, that is fruit. That you're connected to the vine. Following the leading of the Holy Spirit, it's fruit. The worship team, you can go ahead and come back. Jesus continues on in verse 6. If you do not remain in me, Jesus said, you are like a branch that is thrown away and withers. Such branches are picked up, thrown into the fire, and burned. See, Jesus is talking to those who are professing to be Christians and believers, but their lives are contrary to how God's word says we ought to live. Think about Judas. Think about Judas, one of the disciples, right? He looked the part. He was a part of the 12 disciples. He played the part. Everyone around him thought that he was a believer. But Judas, 
for a period of time, he had foliage. He was disconnected from the vine, but he had these leaves and foliage that was continuing to grow. So he kind of blended in, and, and not everyone knew really the heart of Judas and where he was at. And so there was a moment and period of time where Judas was disconnected from the vine, but he still had leaves growing. He was able to cover it up, but eventually Judas looked like this. A dead branch that was withered away. And Jesus is warning believers and Christians that you need to be careful. That's why you need to remain in me so you can produce some fruit and not look like a dead branch. What does your spiritual life look like? Are you producing fruit? Jesus in this illustration and parable. He's talking to believers. He's, he's talking to those that have turned their back on their faith and that spiritual famine will cause people to turn their back on their faith. You can survive for a period of time being disconnected from the vine. I don't know if that's weeks or months. I don't know. But eventually... When you're disconnected from the vine, when you're disconnected from God, you're eventually going to end up spiritually dead looking like this. We're called to abide in him. Spiritual hunger, it, it just doesn't happen. You will never drift towards morality. You're not going to drift towards God. You just kind of drift through life. You're never going to drift towards God. You're never going to drift towards spirituality. You will always drift away. We live in a fallen world, a sinful world. We will always drift away from the things of God. That's why it's going to be a conscious decision that I want a relationship with you. I need to remain in you. It's going to take some work. It's going to take me making conscious decisions of when am I going to read my Bible? When am I going to pray? When am I going to serve? When am I going to attend church? When am I going to be all these things? I need to make conscious decisions because just left the drift and kind of go through life, I'll end up like this. I don't want to end up in a place where I'm in a spiritual famine. Jesus said, he said, seek first the kingdom of God. We need to seek him. And then he says, in his righteousness. And all of these things will be added unto you. We need to stay connected to the vine. So what are the signs that you're heading towards spiritual famine? Maybe you're thinking to yourself, is that me? Well, what does it look like? And this isn't true for everyone, and I believe that there are some mature believers that think this, and there's nothing wrong with it, but you just need to check yourself. If you think, man, I really wish Joey would have been here to hear this message. Let me tell you, I've thought that before. I thought, man, I've heard a message, and I've been sitting in a congregation. I said, man, I, sh I really wish so-and-so would have been here to hear this. And it's like God just, like, man, just smacked me in the side of the face and said, no, no, you need to hear this. What does spiritual famine look like? It puts a strain on relationships. It's abandoning what used to be spiritual habits. Reading your Bible, praying, attending church, serving, giving, all those things. It's abandoning spiritual habits that you used to have in your life. Where now you make excuses of why you don't need those or don't need to do them as often. It's being a consumer, not a producer. Do you come to church just to consume? Consume the great worship that we have. To consume, consume, consume. Or do you come to produce, to serve? to give of yourself. Are there moments and seasons in my life where I just needed to consume? Absolutely. There was a period for about a year where I just needed to sit in a church that I wasn't working at and consume. But that was a season. That is not a lifestyle for a Christian. We need to be producing things. We are part of the body of Christ. Is the fruit of the Spirit lacking in your life? Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness. Not all of us are going to walk around with all of these fruits of the Spirit just glowing in us. 
All right, that's not what I'm saying. But if you find each one of those falling off in your life, one after another after another, it's a sign I'm heading sp- towards spiritual famine. So how do I avoid it? Like, well, Pastor, you've thoroughly kind of worried me a little bit now. How do you avoid it? Well, Jesus told us. It's actually quite simple. Something you shouldn't be scared of. Jesus said, you want to know what to do? Remain in me. That's it. Remain in him, and you're not going to find yourself in spiritual famine. Make reading your Bible and praying a part of your daily routine, serving, attending, giving, being obedient to the things of God, spending time with him. The only way I got to know Susie, even before we were dating, was spending time with her. If I wanted my relationship to grow with her, I got to spend time with her. God wants to spend time with you. And I believe that when we spend time with him, that bonds grow and relationship grows and you become, you actually crave those spiritual things even more. I want everyone to go ahead and stand to your feet today. And we want to do just that. We want to spend some time with him. And that looks different for everyone. But we're going to sing this song and and it's one of my favorite songs. It's called Do It Again. And Because I want God to pour his spirit in my life again. Now, the fruits of that and what that looks like is often different. And this is a problem in the church. Is often we look at the past and how God did it. Well, God did it this way before in my life. So therefore, this is what it's going to look like now. We serve a much too creative God for him to just put him in a box and say, this is how you're going to move in my life every single time. That's not how it works. What I want again is his spirit. What it looks like, I don't care. I just need him in my life. And one of the favorite lines of this song is when he says, your promise still stands. I believe there are people in here that you're like, wondering if the promise that God has given you still stands. There's a powerful line in the song, and I want you to know today that his promise still stands. The promise that he's given you for whatever it is, I don't know what it is. I don't know if it's for your job, your finances, your marriage, your kids. I don't know what it is, but his promise still stands. And we need to have some perspective on the promises and the things of God. They take time. It's in his timing, not mine. Let me tell you, there's some promises that that I have not seen come to fruition for our church. But I'm still believing and praying, you know what, God, that your promise still stands. The things that you spoke to me a year ago, two years ago, four years ago, when I took this job, God, I know your promise still stands. There's still promises in my life, in my family, my marriage. I'm like, God, your promise still stands. And that's what we need to stand on today. Because his promise is always true. And it stands. So as we sing this song together, I just want you to spend some time with him. Allow the Holy Spirit to speak to you. This altar is open. You want to come stand and and just worship. You want to kneel, stand. Whatever you want to do, whatever you feel comfortable, I just want you to spend some time with him. Because maybe you're like, you know what, Pastor? I'm good. I'm strong. I'm actually spiritually growing and things are great. Awesome. But I don't want to ever get close to this. Amen? Amen? I don't want to get close to this. And I, I can remember as a youth pastor, I would tell them, because I'd have students come up to me, and this was always when it came to relationship, they'd ask, you know, physically speaking, how far is too far, pastor? Like, how, wh- wh- where is the line physically with my boyfriend or girlfriend? And I'd be like, I, I, you don't want to get too close to the line so that you're just going to fall over, right? You know, like, if you play with fire too long, you're going to get burnt. Amen. I don't want to get so close to spiritual family, like, oh, I'm just on the side. No, no, I want to keep it so far away. And the, re- and the way that I do that is by spending time with him. So this time is not just for those that are, might be struggling spiritually. It's for those that feel, man, God is just growing and doing things in me. This is for you too. Because we're called to remain in him.